Welcome to this episode of Lights Out, your virtual campfire. I'm your hostess with the mostest ghosties, Sylvia Schultz. Gettysburg is widely considered one of the most haunted towns in America. For three days, the fighting raged not only on the battlefields, but also in the town. This resulted in loads of supernatural activity that is still felt over 150 years later. One of the joys of visiting a place with a paranormal reputation is, of course, tagging along on a ghost tour. I've already got your ticket, so lace up your walking shoes and let's go. Lights out. And one of the common questions that I am asked. Am I going to see a ghost? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I will guarantee that you will see something tonight. Perhaps a car. <laughs> Perhaps a ghost. Okay. Hello. But contrary to popular belief, seeing a ghost is not the most common experience with the supernatural that we have here at Gettysburg. Now, for many of the people here in Gettysburg, the most powerful sensation relating to this battle was not a sight. Let me kind of take you back in time. 1863 Gettysburg. It was a town of about 2,400 people. But all of a sudden, we have converged into this area about 200,000 men. Two grand armies meet, and a great battle takes place. A battle leaving thousands upon thousands of men dead in the streets and fields about our town. On July 4th, Confederates begin to pull out. One of the harder things to find around Gettysburg was a shovel. We didn't have shovels enough to bury the dead. And so they laid out in these streets and fields for four, five, six, eight, ten days. Oh. Imagine that smell. Not roses. Additionally, about 15,000 horses and mules killed as a result of this battle. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we can't bury our soldiers. We ain't burying horses. <laughs> so what they do is they drag them into piles. Throw some porch planks or fence rails on the pile and douse it with kerosene. Light a match. Set the pile of fire. At night, you could see funeral pyres, horses and mules around the town. During the day, you could see the thick black smoke wafting up into the air, covering the town. Imagine that smell. And here's a piece many people never stop to think of. A town of 2,400 people. Almost 200,000 men. 50,000 horses and mules who eat, who sleep, who wake up in the morning. And what's one of those things we typically do shortly after we wake up in the morning? We do our <laughs> In 1863, Gettysburg did not have indoor plumbing. Imagine that smell. So I'm sure you can picture, ladies and gentlemen, in the early days of July 1863, this town stunk. <laughs> so bad, people couldn't go out of their house without gagging upon the stench. So what they would do is they take a rag, 
a handkerchief, and they'd soak it. So it had something like peppermint oil, lilac oil. So when it came time to go out, what they'd do, they'd take the handkerchief, they'd hold it to their face, they'd breathe through the handkerchief. Now this accomplished two things. One, it blocked the smell from getting in. Two, because the scent was so concentrated, it pretty much burned out their nostrils. <laughs> so they couldn't smell anymore. For many of the people here in Gettysburg, the most powerful sensation relating to this battle is not a sight or a sound, but a smell. The smell of lilac. Peppermint, gunpowder, tobacco. So as we begin our journey about town tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I will suggest that you keep your eyes and ears open. Not just for safety reasons. But keep this open as well. Because your next experience with the supernatural here in Gettysburg just may be right under your nose. With that in mind, we're going to begin. Where we are now gives you a rough idea of the position of the Confederate lines at the time of the battle. If you look across the way there, you see the tree line over there. Through the, there's a little dip in the tree line. You might be able to make out a little lighter blue of the water tower. That water tower sits atop Cemetery Hill. That gives you a position of the Union line at the time of the battle. And from here to there, well, we're talking maybe just under half a mile. But it's over there on Cemetery Hill, our next story is focused. Now, on the evening of July 2nd, Confederates attacked Cemetery Hill. They came across this ground and charged up the hill. Well, maybe not as famous as some other parts of the battle, the fight for Cemetery Hill was one of the harder, nastier parts of this battle. Confederates broke through the Union line, but were unable to hold the ground and forced to retreat back down into the hollow, back to their original positions. Now, in the years after the war, as the importance of this battle became better understood, the stories of the battle began to spread. The words that Abraham Lincoln spoke on that hill in November of 1863 began to seep into the American consciousness. And as this Battle of Gettysburg began to take its place in our American mythology, many of the units that had fought here in 1863 would come back to town. And they would dedicate monuments and memorials on the ground where they had fought in July of 1863. Thirty years after the battle, one Union regiment came back here to town to dedicate their monument there on Cemetery Hill. Now, the night before the dedication ceremonies, all the old soldiers got together. They were doing the things that old soldiers like to do, and they get together after many years apart. They were imbibing large quantities of adult beverage. They were swapping stories. They were giving each other a hard time. 
one old soldier. He's getting a hard time from a bunch of the other old soldiers. He's getting a hard time. It's the past 30 years been a little bit nicer to him than everybody else. <laughs> this old soldier hardly looked like he aged tall. Still had all his hair. It was still dark instead of gray. He hadn't developed that extra soldier. Some of the others had. And as such, some of the other old soldiers had given him a hard time. But it's good natured, you know, it's meant in fun, and it's taken that spirit. Well, as the night's going on, they're swapping stories, they're talking about what they remember from those days of July 1863. And as they're going around, he eventually got to the old soldier been getting a hard time. Talk about what he remembered. He said he remembered the weight. He hated to wait. And that's all the army was. Hurry up and wait. Said it kind of embarrassed him to admit it. And he saw the rebels starting their attack. He was kind of glad. Because at least that meant the wait was finally over. Talked about the sounds, the fighting, the smell of the battle. He said, I remember we got the order to reform our line. The order came, we started to move, and as I was starting to move, it was when I got hit. It caught me in the shoulder, it spun me around, I hit the ground like a sack of flour. He said, I looked up, and I saw the regiment moving, and I said to myself, I need to get back with my regiment. I have to rejoin my regiment. And, he said, that was the last thing he remembered that day. Well, the stories continued. Party continued. Eventually began to wind down as all the old soldiers headed back to where they were staying to rejoin the next morning for the dedication of the monument on Cemetery Hill. As part of the dedication ceremonies, the colonel of the regiment recite the roll of honor. He would read the names of the men who upon this ground gave that last full measure of devotion. Who died that their country could live. The colonel got up and he took his list. He began to read from the names of the men, Company A. Continued with the names of the men, Company B. As he was reading from the names of the men, Company C, he stopped them over. Now, some of the people in the crowd commented, looked like the Colonel's face got pale. Others said, for the first time that day, he could see the Colonel's hands. As the colonel read a name. Name of a man just one night before had been getting a hard time because the past 30 years hadn't aged him at all. Man who had said his final thoughts upon this ground were that he had 
to rejoin his regiment. Well, now this is the Gettysburg Municipal Building. This is where our local politicians do their local politician stuff. Had a slightly different function in 1863. In 1863, that building was the Adams County Prison. So yes, we put our local politicians in a prison. <laughs> Just cuts out the middleman. <laughs> well, among the offices there at the municipal building are those of the Gettysburg Parking Authority. They're the people responsible for all our parking here in town all the meters and such. The parking authority has had a long-running disagreement with a buddy of mine named Paul. Now, if you or I would go up to one of the parking meters here in town, you'd look at it and see a little sticker thingy on it that says from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., except for the following holidays, New Year's Day, Martin Luther King Day, President Day, yeah, it goes through the list of holidays. Paul, I believe, would go up to that same parking meter, look at that same little sticker thingy, and believe that it said from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., except for Paul Pierce. Like he thought he didn't have to pay to park in Gettysburg. Well, the meter maids, oh, excuse me, the parking enforcement officers disagreed with this. And as such, Paul often would pick up one of those nice little yellow envelopes that they leave on your windshield that say, pay within seven days, $15. After that, it goes up to 25 After that, it goes up to 42 50 After that, it goes up to 67 50 and should the constable come knocking on your door, it is $103.25. That is the voice of experience telling you that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Pay the 15. <laughs> <laughs> well, one day Paul had gotten a ticket. Now he and his wife Patty were coming out, coming into town that night. So they're coming into town, they come down Stratton Street there, they pull up, Paul pulls up into this parking spot right here. Now I'm not sure how he pulled this part off. He was like listening to the ball game on the radio or something. He convinced Patty, his wife, to run across the street and take care of the ticket for him. So Patty gets out the car, Paul's there sitting listening to the game. When God, that smells like gunpowder. What the heck is gun? And he looked up into the rearview mirror. And in the seat behind him was a young man. Late teens, early 20s. Kind of tired and beat up looking. Wearing the uniform of a Confederate soldier. And this young man was not in the car when Paul and Patty left the house. <laughs> what the? He turns around. Now, before he's turned around, the back seat is empty. There's nothing there but that sulfury smell of gunpowder. So Paul reacts the way probably many of us would. He puts the car in drive and he heads down the street. <laughs> Just as Patty comes around the side of the building, watching him drive away. What's that knucklehead doing? Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you think the air conditioning back at the hotel is cold, <laughs> you should have seen how cold it was in the Pierce household that evening. <laughs> 
Amen. Paul's trying to explain the but Patty, I just I, 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 I just and the, Patty is just not buying this for a second. She's just like, boy, you're so going to pay. <laughs> and he does. Paul spends the next several days doing what we men have been doing since Adam first ticked off Eve in the Garden of Eden. He's kissing butt and trying to get back on her good side. Sends her flowers to the office. Leaves her little lovey notes around the house. Calls her up at work. I'm going to say I love you, Patty. Patty. Hello? 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 <laughs> Paul convinces Patty to allow him to take her out to dinner at her favorite restaurant, the Farnsworth House, where she loves the pumpkin fritters. You've got to try the pumpkin fritters. Well, that afternoon, Paul gets off work. He stops here in town. He stops at the flower shop, gets out the car, walks around the front of the car, past the parking meter, into the flower shop. He picks up some flowers, some balloons. He comes back out, walks around the front of the car, takes the envelope off the windshield. <laughs> oh, come on. Another thing. <laughs> They're coming into town. Paul comes in. He pulls down Stratton Street. He pulls up here onto High Street. He pulls up into this exact same spot. Bum, bum, bum. He looks at Patty. Patty looks at him. Says, I'm not getting out of the car. It's okay, honey. I'll do it. <laughs> so Paul gets out, starts walking across the street to take care of the ticket. Patty's sitting there waiting for him. She decides she's going to check her makeup. So she flips down the visor. And as she flips down the visor for the mirror up there. Oh, goodness gracious. What is that awful smell? Oh, sulfur. And she looked up in the mirror. And in the seat behind her was a young man. Late teens, early 20s kind of tired and beat up looking, wearing the uniform of a Confederate soldier. And this young man was not in the car when Paul and Patty left the house. Oh my goodness, she turns around now. Before she's turned around, the back seat is empty. All that's there is that sulfury smell of gunpowder. Patty's sitting there in the car. Paul comes walking across the street, opens the car. He sits down, closes the car. He looks over at Patty. What's wrong, honey? Patty turned to Paul, her husband, the man she loved. She dedicated her life to Whose children carried, born. She looked at her husband and reached out to the man who meant more to her than anyone else in this world. She reached out. She grabbed him by the throat and said, if you ever get a parking ticket again, I will kill you. <laughs> Paul has not had a ticket for two years. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> yes. That would be insane. Thanks for listening to this podcast. If you're enjoying Lights Out, please check out Podcast Central on Facebook for more of the very best supernatural and paranormal podcasts. Are you a daily practitioner of the craft? Perhaps a weekly or monthly practitioner? Are you a lazy witch like me? Are you still in the broom closet? Well then please allow me to welcome you to the Dragon's Inn, your podcast for witchcraft, the metaphysical, and folklore. 
Folks from all walks of life are welcome. The Dragon's Inn, every other Saturday, available where podcasts are downloaded. That's where the dead guys are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Flash. Uh, but um, they used the third floor of the attic as that skirmish position. Uh, they had the guy in the window. We would uh, take a shot at the guys up there on the cemetery hill. He'd pass the musket back. That guy would pass back, pass off another one. They'd pass another musket up to the guy in the window and take another shot. And that would continue through the battle. Um, and that is why you see all those bullet marks on that south wall. Because the guys up on cemetery hill didn't appreciate getting shot at. And they started shooting back. Uh, this building was hit over 100 times by Union gunfire during the battle. Not all of those shots hit the building. At least one of them hit the guy there in the window. Um, they pulled him back. They tried to do some first stand. They brought him down to the first floor here. Um, he never made it to the second floor. Came down here much to the chagrin of uh, the Sweeney family who lived here at the time, who were down here trying to hide out from the battle. So. And it is said that this soldier never really made it out of the Farnsworth house, and that even today you can hear the sounds of soldiers up there in the garret uh, as they continue their struggle here at the Farnsworth House. That's because of this legend and others. Through the years, the Farnsworth House has developed quite the reputation for being a haunted house. And as such, the Farnsworth House has been featured on a number of TV shows. You know the shows I'm talking about, right? Unexplained Mysteries, Unsolved Spooky Stuff. <laughs> right? You know those shows. Yeah. Now, one evening, a young lady is sitting home. She's watching one of these shows. A segment on the Farnsworth House comes on. Now, this young lady is into ghosts, the supernatural. And the Farnsworth House is a haunted house. Oh, how about that? <laughs> uh, this young lady is also something of a Civil War buff. And the Farnsworth house is a Civil War house. Oh, how about that? That. And this young lady had always wanted to visit Gettysburg, and the Farnsworth house is a Gettysburg house. Oh, great googly moogly. <laughs> it was just too much for her to handle. She gets up the next morning, she gets on the phone. Hey, yes, hello. Yes, I, I, I would like to reserve a room, please. Yes. Yes. Yes, I, I would like a room for a week, please. Yes. Yes, I, I would like a room with a ghost, please. <laughs> kind of the reaction of the guy taking the reservation. It's like, miss, I can't promise you a ghost, but for $50, I'll go up in the attic and I'll drag chains across <laughs> the all night long. That's my husband. <laughs> no, 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 I really want a room with a ghost. Says, well, miss. 
We'll see what we can do. Well, weeks go by. Here comes time. The young lady comes into town. Now, she's coming into town. There's traffic on the highway. Construction on the interstate. Just a mess. It takes her longer to get here than she planned. So by the time she gets here, it's late. She's tired. She decides she's just going to call it a night. So she checks in, she heads on up to her room, she starts getting ready for bed. She washes her face, brushes her teeth, combs her hair. She puts on her nightgown. She gets in the bed, pulls up the covers, turns off the light. She's lying there in bed. In the dark, <laughs> she begins to doze off. She falls asleep. And in the morning, she wakes up. <laughs> She's kind of disappointed. <laughs> She's like coming down from breakfast. Is there something wrong with this? Yes, there's something wrong. I ordered a room with a ghost. All I got was a good night's sleep. <laughs> Morning staff, not sure how to take that one. They're like, well, miss, we'll see what we can do. Well, that morning she heads on up to the National Park, to the Visitor Center. Takes in the things up there. The, the movie, narrated by Morgan Freeman. The, uh, the Cyclorama. A 360-degree painting of Pickett's Charge. Which, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't seen yet, you should. It's an incredible piece of art. She walks through the museum, checking out the exhibits about the war and about the battle. Listens to a ranger do a presentation on part of the battle. And spends her morning up there. She comes back. She has lunch. She freshens up. She decides that afternoon she wants to check out Gettysburg, the town. So she heads on up Baltimore Street. She's taking pictures of historic buildings. She heads up to the town square, which she learns at the time of the battle was called the diamond, but it's still shaped like a circle. <laughs> oh, she's up there. She gets a picture of her standing beside the statue of Abraham Lincoln and the guy in the sweater that looks like Perry Como. <laughs> yeah. you know, people don't get that joke much anymore. <laughs> she spends her day walking around town. She comes back. She has dinner here at the Farnsworth house. Where she has the pumpkin first. Ladies and gentlemen, you gotta try the pumpkin first. <laughs> that evening she goes on a ghost walk. And she... She finds a fellow telling the story. It's very entertaining and enjoyable. She had a great time. And because she had such a good time, she gave him a big tip at the end of the walk. And heads on back to the bed and breakfast. She heads on up to her room. She starts getting ready for bed. She washes her face. And she brushes her teeth. Combs her hair. <laughs> she puts on her nightgown. She gets in the bed, pulls up the covers, turns off the light. She's lying here in bed. She hears somebody coming up the stairs and down the hallway. And it sounds as though they stop right in front of her door. Now, she had never stayed at a bed and breakfast before. So she's thinking, oh, somebody's coming to check about breakfast. Drop off a message. So she sits up, turns on the light. Yes. Hello. Hello. She turns off the light. And after 
after a little bit, she hears the footsteps again. Only now, they appear to be inside the room. She sits up, turns up, who's in my room? What are you doing, Buster? I'll give you the what for you. 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 There's nobody there. And it begins to dawn on her. She'd ordered a room with a ghost. Now it's her. <laughs> This is so cool. <laughs> Hi, ghost. This is just like I planned. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by. Good night. She turns off the light. Okay, girl. And after a little bit, she hears the footsteps again. Now, they appear to be pacing back and forth by the foot of the bed. And after a little while, the pacing stops. And she feels a pressure on the corner of the bed. As if someone had just sat down on the corner of the bed. She sits up, turns on the light. What do you think you're doing? <laughs> this was not part of the plan. <laughs> That's enough of that now. So go along your way. Shoot. Go away. Shoot. <laughs> turns off the light. And to her relief, she feels the pressure on the corner on the corner of the bed lift up. But then it sits back down again. <laughs> Only now, instead of being down by the foot of the bed, it is now up here by her waist. <laughs> begin to shift as if someone who'd been sitting on the side of the bed was turning, picking up his feet, lying down beside her. She feels this Pressure lying down beside her. She jumps out the bed. She jumps out. She starts backing away from the bed. She backs up into the chair that's in the room there and kind of eases herself down into the chair. She spent the rest of her night in the chair and the rest of her vacation at the Quality Inn. <laughs> Is anybody staying at a bed and breakfast tonight by chance? No? Uh, uh, well, see what we can do. <laughs> now what we will do, ladies and gentlemen, at this time is begin to wrap up our time together this evening. A time together that I hope that you have all found to be both entertaining and enjoyable. Uh, 
Uh, I hope that you've had some fun. Yeah. Are we permitted to give you a tip? Yes, you are. Awesome. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. I, and any gifts, tips, presents, things like that <laughs> will be graciously, humbly, and gratefully accepted. Now, one of the things that makes our stories or our, our tours here great is here at Sleepy Hollow, all of our storytellers are independent contractors. That's a fancy way of saying that each storyteller is responsible for his or her own stories, our own equipment, our own tours. So if you did hear a story tonight that you like, ladies and gentlemen, I'd ask you to please tell a friend of ours. Pass the good word along. Put a five-star review on Yelp. You heard a story tonight that you really liked. Remember Ed told it to you. <laughs> Tell all your friends to ask for Ed. <laughs> all right. Now, if you heard a story tonight that you didn't like, or that you thought was kind of stupid, I stole that from one of the ghost walks down on Steinware Avenue. <laughs> Again, I want to thank you all for coming with me tonight. I hope that you've had some fun. I'd like to thank Ed of Sleepy Hollow Tours in Gettysburg for sharing his storytelling prowess with us. If you're in town, do check out the many wonderful ghost tour companies. In the next episode, we're going to spend some time at Devil's Den, a particularly dangerous and paranormally active place on the battlefield. Join me next time as we go Lights Out.